Hi, Dr. Regina Rodman here, and we are gonna talk today about chin surgery, particularly genioplasty. Um, and we'll also talk a little bit about V-line surgery, which is chin surgery plus jaw surgery. Now, if you go forward with this procedure, come to our office, we give you a big packet of information, a big consent, which has a ton of different risks. Um, a lot of those things are super, super unlikely. Um, I've never, there's a few things on here that I've never even heard of that happening, but it is our job as physicians and surgeons to tell you anything that could possibly go wrong that would have a huge consequence. So we list all these things, but what I'd like to do today is give you some information about some things that are uh, more common risks or things that I have actually seen um, or at least heard of happening to somebody. So um, any surgery, anytime, there's a risk of bleeding, scarring, and infection. Now with a genioplasty, risk of bleeding is real. I do put a little compression bandage on afterwards to help minimize any bleeding, but bleeding in the mouth is possible. That is why I have you stay two nights after surgery. So the night after your surgery and then one more night um, in town locally. Uh, and that's because if something does bleed, the risk of bleeding is highest in the first 48 hours. Can still happen later, but the risk is highest those first two nights. Um, so I'd like you to be nearby because if something does happen, obviously I wanna be the one to take care of you. Um, I'm the one that was in the surgery that knows what happened. And so um, I wanna be the one to address it. So that's why I have patients stay for a minimum two nights after surgery. Scarring, pretty low risk. Um, the incision for a genioplasty is all inside the mouth, so that usually heals really, really well. Um, patients may feel some tightness um, or some pulling as it's, as it's healing, but that generally always softens up to a pretty much like invisible area that you can't even really feel with your tongue or anything. So scarring risk is really low. Um, infection, also really low. We do put you on some antibiotics um, afterwards and you get some antibiotics through, um, through an IV before you start surgery. Also, I give patients some antibiotic mouthwash to rinse out their mouth um, so that infection risk remains pretty low. Now, with a genioplasty specifically, not a risk, 100% guarantee everyone is going to be numb in the lower lip. The risk is that that numbness lasts forever um, or it's permanent. Now, I have never seen that happen, but every patient I've ever done is numb. And the reason for that is I do this surgery from inside the mouth. Now, to get to the chin, I have to lift the skin and soft tissues off of the chin. The mental nerves, which are the nerves that give sensation to the lip, come out kind of right here and here. They come out of the bone and then connect to the, to the soft tissue of the lip. In order to get to the bone, I have to actually stretch those a little bit, pull the skin off and stretch those nerves a little bit. The nerves just from being touched protest and just kind of stop working for a while. Now these are big, thick, ropey nerves. I do this surgery two to four times a week, so I know where they are, I know how to protect them. I see them every surgery, every time. I make sure that they're preserved, I pull them out of the way. Um, and so it would be super, super unlikely. I mean, I'd have to just fall asleep or something to actually cut them or damage them, but they do get stretched a little bit. And like I said, in protest, the nerves just go to sleep and don't work for a while. How long they're numb can vary person to person, but in general, I would say it's like two to six months that it's gonna feel just weird. At first, it feels really, really weird. Um, patients may have trouble drinking out of a cup. They may drool. They may have a little lisp. That's all not common, but it's possible um, immediately after the surgery. And that's not because the lip isn't moving. The nerve that moves the lip is a totally separate nerve. It's still intact, it's still working, but the nerve um, that gives sensation to the lip isn't working. And so your brain has a little bit of troubles figuring out where the lip is in space. It's moving, but you don't have the usual feedback to your brain that you're used to. And so what happens is sometimes it, it's a little bit uncoordinated that first week. Usually by the end of the first one to two weeks, the brain kind of figures out, oh yeah, it's still there even though I can't feel it very well and the, any problems with speaking or drinking or anything go away. Um, and also I think some of those problems are also compounded by the fact that the lip is really swollen. Um, 
but so that's that's the worst of it is those first few weeks um but it may still when you touch it just not feel quite right for a couple months after surgery i have always seen it go back to normal um but it may uh it may never be quite quite the way it was in the beginning um just a little bit when you touch it or it may take several months for it to go totally back to normal um other risks with the surgery there's always the risk that the bone doesn't heal. I have honestly never seen this in a genioplasty. Whenever I've seen problems with jaw bones healing, it's been from a trauma or something where it's not a controlled fracture. Um, I've never seen that. Asymmetry is always a risk. Now the important thing, especially with the jaw surgery, is that it is always a little asymmetric. And the reason for this is the jaw was asymmetric before. The two sides of the face grow up like sisters, not twins. Everybody has one jaw side that's slightly larger or smaller than the other. Now patients ask, well then why don't you fix that with surgery? Well, we can make it better, but it's never gonna be perfect. And the reason for that is because the asymmetry that's in the face is created by an asymmetry of both bones, muscle, fat, skin, and all the other kinds of, and all the rest of the soft tissue. In the surgery, the V-line surgery, I'm changing the bones, but I'm not necessarily creating a huge change in the skin, the fat, and the muscles. So we can make it better by making the bones more symmetric, but if a patient has a lot more muscle mass on one side of the face, um, it, they will continue to have a lot more muscle mass and it may still look a little asymmetric. Now, these asymmetries that I'm talking about, these are asymmetries that the patient notices. It's super unlikely that anyone else is noticing these differences between the two sides of your face. It's usually also something that if we bring it up ahead of time and I point out, hey, this side is a little bigger than this side, we'll make it better, but it may not be perfect. Usually the patients understand that that's just kind of the way nature made them and it's okay, but it's an important thing to recognize ahead of time. Um, other risks with the surgery. Um, the other thing that I have seen happen is a problem with wound healing. So this little wound in the bottom of the mouth, it's a dependent wound. So it's easier for food to get stuck here than the incision, say for the buccal fat, which is up high. Since it's dependent in kind of like a gutter, easy for food to get stuck there. And on top of that, it's numb. And so you may not have as good of sensation. That's why I ask patients to rinse their mouth out with a special antibiotic mouthwash every time they eat um, for the first couple weeks after surgery to prevent food from getting caught in there and to prevent a problem with the wound healing. If this doesn't heal, I have always seen it resolved. Um, sometimes it just means I need to put one more, one or two little stitches in there to um, help it to seal back up. Sometimes we put the patients on another course of antibiotics and that is enough to just help close it up. Um, I've always seen it close, but that is a risk and it's something that, again, why it's important to come to your post-op visits and to check in with your surgeon to make sure that it's healing the way that we want it to and to see if there's any intervention or anything we need to do to help it to heal the way that we need it to. Um, other risks um, really are more with the jaw surgery, the back of the jaw. The risk with this surgery is that unlike, so the chin, there's a risk of stretching or a risk or almost a guarantee of stretching the nerve and then the chin being numb. With the back of the jaw, the nerve that moves the face uh, runs or one of the small branches of it actually runs in this path it is possible that that nerve gets stretched, kind of the same thing as the chin, but it's the nerve that moves the lips. It's in a different plane. It's very unlikely that it would get cut or completely damaged, but sometimes in the retraction that we need to do to pull the cheek off of the bone, that nerve gets stretched a little bit. And so I have seen cases where one side of the lip is a little bit weaker than the other. Now again, this is a temporary injury. It's like a bruise to the nerve. Um, and so it does come back, but nerves are just the slowest thing to regenerate. And so it can take weeks, even months for that to come back and be completely normal. And again, when this happens, it's just one branch. So it's not like the whole side of the face is weak, but patients may notice a little asymmetry in their smile. Like they may notice that one side of the lip pulls down and the other side pushes up a little bit. It's temporary, but it can take a few weeks to months for it to completely resolve. 
Um, the other risk is again, not really a risk, but everything in the back of the jaw just tends to swell a lot more than the other areas of the face. And so, especially if we're doing a reduction where we're removing bone or narrowing the chin, it takes a long time to see results. And that's not a risk, that's just the way that the body heals is we're trying to make a space smaller and it's an area that's swollen. Uh, so everything from the face, especially if the patient undergoes other procedures with the forehead nose, it's like all of the swelling just kind of drains and sits down here in the bottom of the face. Um, and so it takes a while for all of that swelling to, of the soft tissue to go down and you to really see your final results. Tell patients at three months, they'll be able to see a nice change, but it's really a full year before you see sharpness and definition and like all the little traits that you wanna see in the chin. So patience, 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 I think is the key to chin and jaw surgery. Um, and um, just knowing that like the results get better with time. Other risk with the surgery, anytime we are reducing bone, but leaving the soft tissue, we have more soft tissue than we have bone. And so there's a risk of the skin looking droopy or kind of saggy. Um, the reason that I do, the most common cut that I make in the jaw is sort of an oblique one so that it takes some of the width out of the jaw, but not so much of the height. It retains a lot of the vertical height. And the reason I do this is so that patients don't end up with too much extra skin there. Um, but anytime we're doing a pretty big bony reduction, there will be extra skin. Now there's a couple options to address that. One is some kind of a skin tightening procedure. Like I personally have the Renuvion, which is a helium plasma skin tightening device. This can be done at the same time as the, the jaw reduction, or if the patient prefers, um, and I actually prefer it uh, when possible, um, to do it about six months afterwards. So do the jaw reduction, let the jaw swell, let everything settle. Then we do the skin tightening procedure to shrink up the skin um, and help tighten the skin along the jawline um, to compensate for the bone that we've taken out. The other option in patients who have a lot of extra skin <clears throat> is to do a facelift. And usually I'll discuss that with patients at their consult if I think that this is gonna to need to be a two-stage procedure where we do a facelift afterwards. I generally also like to wait for that. I like to wait six to nine months um, after surgery so that everything has a chance to settle, all the swelling comes down, and I can see exactly what needs to be lifted, what needs to be pulled, where we need to cut off some extra skin um, to show that nice jawline. So. Um, extra skin, again, it's not a risk. It's not a complication of the surgery. It is a sequela. It's something that happens whenever we remove bone and leave the same amount of soft tissue, it will droop a little bit. So it's important to think about that and plan for that um, when you're thinking about doing a jaw reduction. Um, those are pretty much the big risks. Um, everything else that I've, I've read some things on the internet about damage to tooth roots, um, I, that is certainly possible, but it's so unlikely. I mean, it is very obvious where the tooth roots are. It's very obvious where the cuts need to be below the nerves. Um, I have never actually heard of that happening. So um, hopefully that's a really, really minimal risk. Um, these ones, numbness being the big one, are really the things to think about um, when you're planning your procedure.